everybody, welcome back. It is the Razball Fantasy Baseball Podcast. I am beat on, joined by the fantasy master Lothario himself, Gray Albright. How's it going over there, Gray? And also the number one fantasy baseball ranker, according to <laughs> Fantasy Bros. Huh? <laughs> the funniest. The funniest is I have uh, crapped on Fantasy Pros uh, rankings Ranking. contest <laughs> for, I don't know, maybe a decade. <laughs> I've I've said so many times that I've got I've said so many times that it's like it's not a reliable test. <laughs> and now that I've come in first, I'm like, yeah, that's all it's all that matters. <laughs> it doesn't matter that you didn't win any leads and you know that like balls were really like, you know, off the wall a little bit and players we actually drafted didn't really work out. That doesn't matter. If you get the ranks right and the projection exactly. right. Exactly. Oh, yeah. No, totally. Yeah, no. Uh, giving them hell even when they give me flowers. That's that's really the most important thing for me. <laughs> I mean, I, I really hope one year I win it just because I hate ranking. So it's going to be like, I hate it. I got the number one. <laughs> and I really hate that. Like, it's just like accumulation of all things that I hate <laughs> all in one. So, like, it, it, it's perfectly fine. Um did you see the? Uh, did you see my comment to Fantasy Pros? They they announced the winner, uh, me, and I said I still think this contest sucks, but congrats to me. <laughs> I cracked myself up. Ah, oh, it's so rich. It wasn't right. last grade. That's that's really the only goal at any year for any league. Like uh, you know, I wasn't I wasn't last. Uh, I wasn't the worst. Um, yeah. I think I've uh, I think I've ha- I think I've been the worst before. <laughs> I think there's been years where I've been the worst. You know, it's honestly though, I, you know, all kidding aside, I still think the contest is really flawed because there's so many different leagues. You can't rank for every league. Like there's no way. It's impossible. Like how you draft in a 20 team mixed league is a lot different than how you draft in an 18 mixed league. I'm sorry, it's true. So, the way your rankings, I mean, it's all just every ranking, no matter who's, whose rankings they are, whether they're my rankings or someone else, they're just suggestions. <laughs> no one's telling you this is exactly how you have to draft anyone. If they are telling you that, they're they're full of it and you shouldn't listen to them. Every, yeah. every ranking is a suggestion. That's all it is. I can promise that if you follow my rankings to a T, uh, you will not draft a pitcher until about the 15th round. Um, <laughs> you will have three times more speed than you need. Uh, and you will not have a catcher until, you know, the, the very last round. Like, if you, you have my rankings perfectly, you will draft Bo Bichette every round. <laughs> somehow, somehow he's in every single round. Uh, it's it's hard to explain exactly how, but he is. <laughs> yeah, and around like round five, he starts to be a value. So, you know, that's good. So, you know, you'll throw away a few picks right off the bat. Uh, um, You're only wasting four Bo Bichettes. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> um, if you if you want to challenge yourself to use our rankings against us and take our players, you can sign up for the RCLs, the Razball Commenter Leagues. Signups are up. There's a post on Razball. I'll try and link to it into this podcast post as well so that you can just click in here if you're listening. And I'll throw it up on YouTube on that post too. Um, you know, I have a league. I think last time I looked, I have about four spots left. I have one of the, the paid leagues. Uh, I haven't looked at Gray's league. I'm sure his is is also filling up very quickly. Uh, so if you want to get into Razball, if you want to, and you're also going to get compared against all the other RCLs, you're going to get compared against the Riders League, the Perts League, uh, the other leagues that I'm not invited to because I'm not cool enough yet uh, to get into those. So, you know, there's all sorts of leagues out there you can join depending on when you're available, what you want to do, if you want to pay, if you don't want to pay. Um, and it's a completely different experience than most leagues out there because of the format and, and the level of, of talent that we have uh, playing in each league. Yeah, no, totally. Yeah. The, the RCL, honestly, like I'm in, uh, 
I'm in Tat Wars. I'm in labor. I'm in a bunch of like leagues that are quote unquote uh, have experts in them. Uh, the Raz Slam. But I honestly, I think the RCL is like one of my f- most fun leagues. I, I love the RCL league. I love the format. I, I really enjoy the 12 team mixed league. I feel like it's the perfect balance of leaving guys on waivers and picking guys up who are hot, but also not being not dropping guys uh, who could come around. Like it's really, it's really challenging. I, I like 12 team mix league. Um, anyway, yeah, sign up. Um, there, uh, there are links all over Razzball. Okay. Anyway, moving on to our positional preview continuing. We are moving on to the outfielders. This is going to be two shows. We're going to try and move fast as, as fast as we can through this. Of course, if you've listened to the show, you know pretty much what that means. Um, mm-hmm. But, you know, at least at least right off the bat, we get to skip to number 10, Greg, because one through nine, we have already covered in our top 20 podcast because, yeah, nine outfielders made the top 20. It's a very nice position. Uh, I'll just run through the names real quick. It's Ronald Acuna, Julio Rodriguez, Corbin Carroll, Kyle Tucker, Mookie Betts, Fernando Tatis Jr., Aaron Judge, Juan Soto and Jordan Alvarez. Those are the outfielders in your top 20. Coming in at number 10, starting the next tier and just outside the top 20 for you, or, well, I have, I don't have your uh, full rankings pulled up, so I'm not sure where he sits, but number 10 is Adalas Garcia. Last year, he went 39 home runs, 9 stolen bases, 108, 107, 245. You have a projected for 35 home runs, 12 stolen bases, 91, 103, and a 247 average. We have been the Adalas Garcia podcast for years, Gray, and uh, we're still supporting him. <laughs> yeah, no, completely. I think Ald- I think Adalas Garcia, pound for pound, uh, year after year, he is probably the one of the most underrated guys, year in and year out, no matter what he does. Like it's like he hasn't been bad for three years, yet somehow he's still underrated. It's not an easy accomplishment. I I guess it's because of the um, the average, I, his batting average. I mean, I'm assuming that must be why people are uh, down on Adalas Garcia versus other people. But honestly, like I'm I'm at ten overall uh, in my outfielder rankings for him. He's getting drafted at twelve. He's going roughly. 10 picks after, uh, maybe 15, 15 picks after I have them, um, 15, uh, overall picks, um, to outfielder, like I just said. And last year he was the eighth best outfielder on the player Raider. So even I'm technically, I'm even a little bit lower on him than <laughs> is what he deserves. Uh, I, you know, I, I say this so many times, but I guess it's worth repeating that, like, if you have power and speed, which Adalas Garcia has, there's, you know, there it's so hard to be completely, uh, you know, uh, worthless in fantasy. Like, it's not, it's not an easy thing to pull off if you have like you know, power and speed, and he has that easy. I mean, easy power. I've been saying this for years that like he's got thirty-five plus homer power easily and he's also last year he only stole nine bags but he's got 15 steel speed it's just whether or not he wants to run that's all the the difference between nine steals like he had last year and 17 steals is just a a want to to run that's it there's no other difference really it's just whether his desire is there hopefully it's there i mean there's no way of you know figuring that out. Um, but yeah, I mean, his, uh, his strikeouts really aren't that bad. His walks were way up last year. He's really not, he's not a bad hitter. I, I don't fully, and you know, which uh, this is more anecdotal, uh, versus anything, but like, I feel like people like him. I know that doesn't really matter for fantasy, but there's an element of people looking at a guy and watching him like in the playoffs and stuff and getting excited about him and seeing him like, you know, Homer in the playoffs and people get 
you know, pumped up and, you know, they, they like him as a player, you would think that would translate a little bit, but I don't think it really does with him. For whatever reason, people are not really that into Adolis Garcia. I don't know exactly why, um, but yeah, I mean, he's going on three straight years of being really valuable. So I have no problem drafting him as the 10th outfielder off the board. Yeah, I, I can't really explain why he doesn't get more love than he does. It could be the average. It could be the late breakout to where, like, he broke out at 28. So, like, going into 29, people were skeptical. And then he goes into his age 30 season. You're like, he's 30. He, like, broke out late. It, you know, it's not going to happen. He's had high, he's had high K rates. But he hits the ball hard. He's always produced. Um, I will say, you know, in regards to the speed and the stolen bases – his sprint speed has dropped, I mean, fairly significantly kind of each season. Like he loses like a half foot per second each season, which, you know, losing a foot per second in two years is pretty strange or, or abnormal. So, you know, I, I think he can steal, you know, that that's there. He has the, the knowledge and the timing of it. He's done it before. Um, the speed may not be as prevalent. Uh, but I think last year was really just a, a matter of the, the Rangers offense being a lot stronger than it has in years past. So they just, you know, they left him there so that somebody else would just drive him in instead of trying to get him, you know, moving along on his own. Moving on to number 11, which is Luis Robert, Louis Robert Jr. Uh, 30, 38 home runs, 20 stolen bases, 90, 80, 264 last year. You have him projected for 31 home runs, 17 stolen bases, 93, 91, and 269. He played a career high of 145 games. That is up 47 games from his previous high of 98 games. And somehow he registered his fastest sprint speed since 2020, Gray. Uh, this is a guy that we have not really been a fan of. More, again, because of the playing time issues. Are you willing to forgive that now that he's done it for a season or are you still skeptical? Yeah, no, I, I'm absolutely, I'm fine with uh, Louis Robert Jr. Now, if he's, you know, I'm, I'm really hesitant about a guy before they've shown they can stay healthy for a full season, but he's done it. I'm, I'm, I'm willing to, you know, I'm willing to let that go. Uh, my other, my other concern now with Louis Robert Jr., uh, I just saw, you know, and this is obviously spring training, so take it with a grain of salt. But uh, speaking of salt, I saw uh, the White Sox spring training lineup, and boy, is that bitter. <laughs> That's a, that is a bitter pill to swallow. <laughs> that is like, wow. They got Kevin Pillar leading off, Paul DeJong hitting second, <laughs> And then a bunch of guys I've never even heard of. <laughs> I mean, Louis Robert wasn't even playing in the first spring training game. So obviously it's a lineup that is going to change a little bit. But man, if you look at their projected uh, opening day lineup, it's not going to change that much. <laughs> they're, they're, they're looking at Dominic Fletcher like he's going to be a starting outfielder. Um, okay. <laughs> Not good, man. Not good. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Uh, I think I could talk uh, I could talk for another <laughs> 20 minutes about the White Sox just in general. Because the fact that Reinsdorf <laughs> is like, you know, I mean, he, he probably has another – you know, three years tops on this earth. And he's worried about getting a new stadium for his team that he's not investing in at all. It's like, dude, are you like talking about galaxy braining something? It's like, don't you want to like have a good team? Like the, like the Padres owner who passed away. Like, don't you want to have a good team before you die, bro? <laughs> Isn't that something you want? Anyway, that's off topic. Um, yeah, Louis Robert, I'm fine. You know, I'm fine with him. I, I, I honestly, I don't think I've ever drafted him before, but I can see it now. I, I mean, I, I wouldn't. You know, I don't know if I'm necessarily. I think I'm probably around his ADP. 
uh, for, uh, let's see, he's the 10th outfielder off the board, and I have him at 11. So, you know, that's a rounding error. Yeah, I could see drafting him. I I don't see anything really, like, in his stats that worry me outside of, you know, like I just said with his lineup. So, I mean, counting stats might be an issue, but... Yeah, he's got he's got solid power. He can steal if he wants. Again, it's a it's a desire thing more than anything, and he should hit for a decent average. So yeah, I like him. Yeah, I I uh, I mean I can't ignore the possibility of what he can do. He's now shown it across a full season, so that's definitely you know in there. I have him ranked. I mean I think I'm right in pretty much in line with with what his ADP is in regards to positional. And then overall, I think the only difference is that I don't have, uh, you know, 10 pitchers listed in front of him. So that's, that's the uh, difference in the overall, but yeah, I, I have no problem with them. I think in most draft rooms I'm in, there's somebody who's more willing to overlook the games played issue with him. And the fact that the white Sox are trotting out a quad a lineup at best, but that's probably my only concern really is the injury and then the lineup being around him. The the talent is, is obvious. Like we know he's, he's really good when he's healthy. Number 12 is Randy Rosarena. Last year he had 23 runs, 22 stolen bases, 95, 83 and hit 254. Young project for 22 home runs, 25 stolen bases, 91, 88 and 266. Uh, I mean, he had a, another good season. Uh, I mean, Randy's Randy's a really solid, solid attribute for any team. Yeah, no, completely. Yeah, I was uh, I was just looking at the player radar. He came in uh, 16th for outfielders last year. Uh, he's going at a uh, he's going at third. He's going as the 13th outfielder off the board. I have him at 12. Yeah, I mean, I there's I don't know if there's a ton to say about a Rosarena. I think he's got like you know 20 homer power, 20 steel speed, and he's still in that you know sort of prime of his career. So I'm not too worried about it. You know, down the road, maybe in a couple of years, I could see potentially being concerned that, you know, he might lose some speed at, at some point. And, you know, uh, if he's only a 20 homer power guy, then, you know, eventually that can become like a 15-15 guy, which isn't great. But right now, I'm not really worried about it. Last year, he had a little bit of a, a down year for Babbitt which uh, produced a low average for him, uh, 254. But I could see that bouncing back. Most projections show him hitting around 260, 265, where I have him at 266. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't really think there's a, a ton to talk about Randy Rosarina. I mean, he is what he is at this point. As, as long as he keeps doing what he's doing, I, I'm totally fine with him. 2020 room for room for growth on both of those numbers. And yeah, I do expect the average to come up just a little unlucky. All the numbers from batted ball are in line with what he's done in his career. Actually, his hard hit was the best he's ever had. His K rate was the best he's ever had in any full season along with his walk rate. So I, I fully expect the, the average to bounce back and him to give you pretty much what he's always given you since he's gotten up into the majors. Uh, number 13 is Nolan Jones, and number 14 is Cody Bellinger, who we both talked about on the first Baseman podcast. Starting at number 15, which is a new tier, is Michael Harris II. 138 games last year. He had 18 home runs, 20 stolen bases, 76, 57, and 293. Uh, you know, normally I don't really mention the games unless it's significant, but he missed them right off the bat, so we knew we, he was missing them. Um, so I feel like, you know, that's that's fairly important. It wasn't a in season type of thing. Uh, really the only thing I need from him is to, to steal the two spot, two spot platoon versus righties from Ozzy Albies. Gray. Yeah. He's actually, he's the polar opposite of Adolis Garcia. Whereas everyone loves Michael Harris, the second, even though like the numbers don't necessarily back up the love. I mean, I'm, I have him at 15th. Yeah. I have him at 15th overall for uh, outfielders. Uh, he's at 11th, he's at, he's at, he's the 11th outfielder off the board, um, ADP as of right now. And he was the 26th, uh, outfielder on the player Raider last year. Now, like you mentioned, he missed some time, but he still played 138 games. I mean, he didn't miss that much time. 
So, yeah, I think, uh, you know, I, 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 I can see, though, that he's he's getting better. Like, I can see the, the trajectory of him, like, you know, possibly taking off at some point and going from, like, you know, the 2020 guy to a 30-30 guy. I, I see that. I mean, it, that's definitely, you know, a possibility for him. Um, I And the lineup is obviously great. I don't have, like, you know, a ton. Like, last year I was out on him. I thought he was really overpriced in drafts. Um, this year... I'm still lower than most people, but I'm not that I'm not so dramatically lower that I, you know, I, I wrote an overlay uh, overrated post again for him or anything. I I'm, I don't mind Michael Harris a second. I think I'm probably a hair behind other people to the point where I don't know if I'm necessarily going to draft them. I, I don't see that, uh, you know, in the future for me with uh, him, but I also am not, completely against other people doing it like I was last year like last year I felt like I was I think it was like you know I was also the number one drafter uh excuse me ranker according to fantasy pro so I, I I'm obviously speaking from a, a very uh uh smart place <laughs> smart smart yeah the uh smart is also a, gr- a great adjective <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, when you say smart, uh, are you being smart? No. Anyway, Michael Harris the second, I think is, uh, you know, he's probably got the potential to be great. We have not seen him be great yet. Uh, and people are drafting him like we have. That's, that's really all I have to say on him. Um, also the lineup, it's kind of hilarious that like, he stays the same. It's, he's kind of like the Matthew McConaughey in Dazed and Confused, uh, that character who's like, uh, who says that, you know, I, I get older and, and they stay the same age. Michael Harris II, he stays the same. And then the Braves lineup gets a little bit worse each year and he moves up the lineup. <laughs> he's not, like, he's literally, uh, he needs like five more guys in the Braves lineup to get worse and he'll just keep moving up. But right now he's behind Ozuna, uh, according to roster resource and in front of Sean Murphy. I remember, you know, last year, Michael Harris, the second, I think started off as a nine hole hitter. And then the Braves went and got Orlando Arcia. They got Kalanick. <laughs> they have Murphy. So it's like Harris is slowly working his way up that lineup. But there's no way he's leapfrogging Matt Olson, Austin Riley, Ozzy Albies, or Acuna. That's just not happening unless, you know, something were to happen. You know, knock on wood, nothing happens. But something were to happen, like, injury-wise, and Albies or Acuna or Riley need a replacement. Then Michael Harris will move up again. But right now, it's like he's in such a stacked lineup, I just don't see where he's going from. He's like, he's stuck. He's stuck in the six hole, which is crazy because there's very few teams where he wouldn't be at least the two hole hitter, if not the leadoff guy. I mean, imagine Michael Harris the second. Speaking of the White Sox just before, Michael Harris the second, he would get like 600 at bats as the leadoff guy for the White Sox. Um, instead, he's like, you know, looking at the six hole. Anyway, um, yeah, that's my thoughts. <laughs> Still think there is a, a chance that he goes up and plays or hits out of the two spot versus righties. This is my, this is the thing I am trying to will this off season into happening <laughs> uh, is that he gets the two spot versus righties. Cause Ozzy Albies has never been good versus righties from a average on base perspective. I push, I'm pushed back on that because I don't have a problem with that personally, but Snicker is, he is so, such a like uh he is so about like just set it and forget it with his lineup card that like he doesn't even platoon anyone like they got Kalenic and Snicker was like yeah he's an everyday guy it's like wait they're gonna really play Kalenic against lefties like yeah sure Uh, Snicker really does not do anything with his lineup all year that's that would be my only pushback on that, but I I'm fine with him going into the two hole versus righties, but I I don't think it's happening. I agree. I agree that it's it's probably not going to happen. I'm just I'm trying 
to will it to happen, Gray. I'm just, I'm, I just as, as much as I can say it, post it. I'm just trying to, to you know, manifest this this into happening. Um, as much as I love Ozzy Albies, like, you know, he's like a 300, 350 hitter against lefties and like a 240 hitter against righties. <laughs> let's let's make an adjustment here. Um, I mean, I, and you're right. Snickers like the guy who who like drafts his lineup and you're like, hey, you know, this isn't a draft and hold, right? Like you can you can move people around and make pickups and they're just like, I'm good. I, I like my team. I drafted. Like, OK, cool, cool, cool. cool. I, I did. I called that with Kalenic too. As soon as he signed there, I was like. He's gonna be an everyday player. <laughs> it's just the Snicker does not. He does not ch- like. He he barely swaps out Sean Murphy with uh, De Arno for like even like once a week. <laughs> like he plays everyone every day. Um, like it's it, uh, unless they're injured, of course. But yeah. He is simulating a baseball season on MLB The Show and just leaving his stars in there every time. Same five rotation, no injuries on. Like, that's what he's going with. Um, all right, moving on from, from this. Number 16 is Jazz Chisholm Jr. 97 games last year. He went 19 home runs, 22 stolen bases, 50, 51 hit, 250. You have projected four, 25 home runs, 25 stolen bases, 71, 74, and 247. Uh, we know the skill set, Gray. Uh, he, I mean, I, I feel like I keep giving him a pass when I have never given Louis Robert a pass. But, like, I, I feel like Jazz's chances of finishing the season are still higher, even though I've seen it from Louis Robert, than it is from Louis Robert. Am, am I wrong? Am I just Am I just letting my biases creep in here? Yeah, I mean, I see, like, I understand the excitement for, like, a Jazz Chisholm Jr. because he really is, like, I feel like he's the kind of dynamic player that could be a top 10 overall pick. Like, I I totally could see that happening with him. But he's also, like, in center field, I mean, he's going to run into the wall at some point and miss at least two weeks of the season. Like, that's that's absolutely going to happen. I don't know why he's playing center. Um, I think he was actually, I, you know, and then uh, backtracking on what I literally just said, I think he was, you know, decent as a center fielder defensively. But, man, he's just like, he is an accident waiting to happen out in the outfield. I, I just don't see him getting through the season. I have him down for 451 at bats. That honestly, that might be optimistic. I don't know. I don't know, man. Like he did, uh, that would be his second highest career total in 2021. He had 464 at bats. I mean, so it barely, it would be barely his, you know, almost his career high. If he reaches 450 at bats, I don't know, man. I, I, you know, I hope he stays healthy. Like he feels like the kind of guy, like if he stays healthy and that's like, you know, your, uh, your role to die and um, you grab him, like he can, uh, he can really shoot up, I think in drafts to the point where, like I was just saying, like he can be a, a, a top 10 overall pick next year. I do see that potential from him. But I really, man, I, I think I'm out on Jazz Chisholm. He's really, he scares me in, like, so many ways. Uh, it's not only the injuries, too. Like, now you have uh, Tim Anderson over there. And, and both of them together, that feels like, instead of oil and water, just, like, oil and oil or water and water or <laughs> whatever. It's just, like, like they feel like they're going to just antagonize each other. And there is just going to be like Jazz Chisholm's going to be like, you know, talking crap to the other team. And Tim Anderson going to talk crap. And then they're both just going to get beat up as be like, oh, man, <laughs> just like leave guys alone. Leave my guys alone. Um, yeah, I don't know, man. I like I like Jazz Chisholm Jr. a lot from a real baseball standpoint uh, from fantasy. I have, I have a real hard time with them. I just I don't know. I, I don't I don't see myself drafting him. I and everything looks fine, except for his splits for his lefties are pretty bad. I will say that that's a, that's worth noting. Like last year, he hit lefties. Like uh, was it lefties? Yeah, he hit left. He he hit lefties really bad to the point where he might get platooned out uh, with John Birdie taking some at bats from him. Uh, which would be really just like, I mean, that seems ludicrous 
to be honest, because uh, he is like the face of the franchise. To take the face of the franchise out of the lineup to platoon is that's pretty bad. So I I kind of don't see it, but in some ways, when you look at his lefty uh, splits, you're like, yeah, I mean, he did hit like 170 versus lefties. So yeah, I don't know. I, I think I'm out on this year though. Uh, the uh, the lefty thing is is not a good look, and it's been I'm gonna uh, two seasons where the average looks bad in 2022. Like he didn't even play enough games to really count that. Uh, in 2021, which is you know the the most full season that he has, he hit 237 versus lefties. So uh, you know I I am hoping I, and I don't think like the 170 is 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 locked in where he's just never gonna be able to do it. But yeah, it, it's definitely a legitimate concern. Uh, I do think he's probably, like, barring other than maybe prospects that are coming up this year, I think he's probably the cheapest guy who could end up being, like, a top five player pretty easily, like, without trying to stretch and, and pull things out of the middle of nowhere. Uh, so I, I'm probably going to end up with a lot of shares because that's just that's what I, I really enjoy going after. Um, especially early on, like when you can grab those guys, that's, that, that's kind of what I, what I'm looking for. Um, but I, I completely understand if, if you're wanting to maybe go in another direction and not take him. Um, I will say in my, in my wharf draft, which happened last weekend, I started Corbin Carroll, Marcus Simeon, Ellie De La Cruz and Jazz Chisholm. Damn! It, it may be <laughs> awful, but it's gonna be so. It was. It's gonna be so fun to watch, Gray. <laughs> oh man, that sounds like a, a a kind of team I draft in like Tout Wars, where I just like I just go for exciting. <laughs> like, that's you know what? what I did, Gray. Uh, it's it's the wharf draft. It's uh, you know, it's in it's live, so I like to like stand up and tell everybody I'm making fun picks. So you know, that always adds to it. Um, <laughs> and there's an overall. So anytime there's an overall, I'm I'm shooting for the moon. Um, let's move on though. Next tier here is number 17, Mike Trout, 82 games last year. He had 18 home runs, two stolen bases, 54, 44, and hit 263. Young projected for 30 home runs, two stolen bases, 74, 82, and 272, and just over 400 at bats. Uh, again, I mean, we're kind of in this area where if he could stay healthy, he's going to give you numbers, but Mike Trout really... Really hasn't been staying healthy. The DH is finally available since Otani's gone, but I don't even know if Mike Trout's the kind of guy who would go to a, a full-time DH role or, like, accept that. Yeah, no, probably not yet in his career. I don't know. I think uh, I think he might – maybe he DHs, like, 10%, 15% of the time. Anyway, I actually – I think Mike Trout right now – for the first time in a while is a really good bargain. Like I, I know he's injury risk, but like last year he had a broken hammock bone. That is totally a fluky injury. Like that has nothing to do with anything. If he can stay on the field for 120 games, like what he did in 2022 for in 119 games, he hit 40 homers and 283. Like, he's really good. Like, he's still really good, even in a prorated season. I could see, like, I could see being all in on Mike Trout. Like, I, I, for the first time in a while, I'm saying that, too. Like, I've been out on him for a good, like, when he was a top 20 overall pick for, like, five or six years there, I was, I was kind of out on him. And he still was okay. Like, you know, don't get me wrong. He's still Mike Trout. But... I, I think right now, for whatever reason, he's re like he's a bargain in drafts. He's right now he's at ADP of uh, 65 overall, the 16th uh, outfielder off the board. And, and that feels like that feels like a pick where, like he's gonna go. He kind of reminds me of I don't know if people remember, but like Paul Goldschmidt, like two years ago, uh, I think it was, uh, people thought he was done being good and people were out on him and he was going at like 65, 70 overall. And then he put up like another year of being a top 20 guy. I could see Mike Trout at the end of the day being like a top 25 hitter 
and he's going at like 65, 70 overall. I, I think he's a great bargain. I'm I'm all in on Mike Trout. Yeah, I, I mean, I think Trout's a, a nice buy, and it it, it kind of depends on your league a little bit. You know, if it's a name value type of league, Trout's probably going to go earlier than he should. But I think in a lot of leagues, you're right, where people are scared off of the number of games he played last season. So there definitely could be some value there. Um, would you take, and I, I know your rankings are up, but you know, I'm, I don't have them in front of me. Would you rather have Mike Trout or O'Neill Cruz, your boy? Um, my rankings were the number one rankings, uh, according to fantasy pro the, the, we, we talked about that, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, you know, that's like, that honestly is like a pick them. It's so hard to say. I like O'Neill Cruz a ton. Um, I would say it kind of is dependent on the team that I'm building at that point because you're already pro you're you're a good like probably four picks into the draft at that point. So it kind of depends if I have an outfielder or I, if I have a, a middle infielder. So I'll, I'll say it's like a toss up. Uh, push comes to shove, I think probably O'Neill Cruz. Um, just because I really, I really like O'Neill Cruz a lot. <laughs> I love, I love the power and speed with O'Neill Cruz. Um, but I like Mike Trout though. You know, that's, that's not taking anything away from Mike Trout. Uh, I like him at his price. I'll say that like, you know, I'll, I'll add that caveat because it is kind of because of his price, but the price is good. <laughs> Mike Trout right now is like, he's great. I mean, he's still, a, you know, he's a 270 hitter with, 30 homers in like uh, 120 games easy. And then if you consider like if the league is shallow enough, like if you're in a 12 team mix league, you can replace his, you know, 40 games that he misses each year. That's an, that's a easy to replace off of waivers. So yeah, I would, I like him. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. Moving on. Number 18. Christian Yelich, last year he had 19 home runs, 28 stolen bases, 106, 76, and 278. You have projected for 17 home runs, 20 stolen bases, 102, 64, and a 262 average. Uh, Yelich was was buoyed by the run rule changes, uh, which helped him boost his stolen base number and made him a usable fantasy asset again. Do you see that continuing, Gray? Uh, I was just looking at the, uh, uh, you know, I was, when you were, uh, yeah, yeah, I do. I'll answer your question first. <laughs> yes. Yes, I do. But also I was just looking at like, uh, last year, I'm not surprised to see this either. Uh, cause I was looking at his projections. Yelich's projections are essentially Randy Rosarina's, uh, Rosarina's projections, um, give or take a few homers. So I was looking at like what uh, they were on the player radar last year, and it didn't surprise me to see that Yelich was much better than a Rosarena on the player radar. So Yelich is, he's again like Mike Trout. Yelich is, I think, getting, he's a, got a bad rap right now in drafts where he is, he's underrated, which is odd because he's been in the league for, you know, what, 10 years? I mean, he's, he's been around. Everyone knows who he is. But, yeah, I think he's actually a little bit underrated right now because, you know, everyone feels like the. I, I think everyone still thinks of that huge, you know, MVP 44 homer insane year he put up in 2019 that they have now, you know, realized that he's really more of a 20 homer hitter. But 20 homers and 20 plus steals and a 280 average is, I mean, that's not bad. <laughs> You know, that's and he's going to play every day, assuming healthy, obviously, that's for anyone. But, yeah, I mean, he's going to play one hundred and forty five games. Yeah, I mean, he's he's a little bit underrated now. Again, not a guy I usually would go for, but I think I would be in on Yelich, too, at his price. I, I like it. Yeah, for me, it's he does drop. So if he drops the right area, I have I have no problem taking him. Um, I, I am a little worried in the regards to the repeat. He had 21 stolen bases in the first half, only seven in the second half. So I'm not sure why he stopped running, but if he stops running again and becomes a, you know, 
18 home run, 15 stolen base guy, that's that's like a lot of the outfielders we're gonna get gonna get to at the end of this show. Um so like I feel like last year is the upside for him, and there's still you know downside for his speed just to if he does what he did in the second half, like again, 15, 17 stolen bases, not as special. The launch angle still shit. It's always been shit. Um sprint speed was fine. It was it was still at the same as it was in 2022. So I don't, you know, from a speed perspective, nothing really changed. Uh, just the rules changed. And I don't know what happened there in the second half. So uh, I, I don't end up with a lot of Yelich again, just because I don't necessarily see him repeating and somebody just ends up drafting him kind of before, before I would, but if he falls, you know, the numbers are fine. Moving on to 19, Josh Lowe, last year in 135 games. He had 20 home runs, 32 stolen bases, 71, 83, and 292. You're projected for 17 home runs, 25 stolen bases, 62, 70, and 281. Uh, I, I think I like Josh Lowe more than when you let you as of, you know, if we're just, I'm going to nitpick and, and go by one single spot in your rankings. Uh, yeah, but I also was the number one um, ranker last year, so mm, I don't know. Be none. Yeah. <laughs> that doesn't mean everything was right, you know. He still had Bo Bichette over Bobby Witt. Uh, okay, so Josh, I'll say this with Josh Lowe. Like, I think he is probably one of the most difficult guys to rank because his playing time is so, like, I don't know, man. <laughs> I don't know. I, I guess he's going to get... 400 and like I have him for I have him down for 429 at bats. He could get maybe 450, but we know he's getting platooned. Like even him being good last year, and he was good last year, even then he was platooned. <laughs> so it's like you you have to expect he's gonna lose at least 150 at bats. And um in shallower leagues, that's totally fine. Like I, I have no pro. Like in a twelve-team mixed league, if you're able to, and it's a daily league, and you're able to like switch him out, he's totally he's totally fine. And at the end of the day, like I do think, like I have him projected for seventeen twenty-five. I do. I I think he's like, just like Yelich, and uh, Jazz Chisholm, and Michael Harris the second. Just like all these guys who are like, these are all kind of like twenty twenty guys. Like in the same mold as those guys being 2020 guys, I think Josh Lowe is more or less around a 2020 guy, but his counting stats are going to hurt because he's getting platooned. So you're looking at like 60 runs, 70 RBIs versus the like 85 runs, 90 RBIs, 85, uh, 85 runs, 80 RBI guys that I've uh, previously mentioned. So it's like Josh Lowe is going to be a little bit less valuable. Just, you know, even if he repeats like last year, I I think he's a little bit less valuable just like at, at at the at the base level. Now, if if we're looking at like the player rater for last year with Josh Lowe, you see he was the 14th best outfielder off the board uh last year. So it's like he's not like he wasn't bad last year. It's just like I think that might be as as long as he doesn't have like an everyday job and he is platooned 14th best outfielder feels like the ceiling for him and nothing but like you know and because he's getting platooned I mean you have like a much more dramatic uh, floor for him versus like a Yelich for instance like Yelich is definitely not getting platooned like he's playing every day uh, whether you want whether you want that or not, in some cases you may not want it, but he will play. Um, Josh Lowe, I just I I just get concerned when a guy is going to miss 150 at bats off the bat with like, you know, uh, from the jump he's missing 150 at bats because of the platoon. So then if he struggles and he and he struggles say for 75 at bats. So now you're down to a guy who's already like so now he's at like 300 good at bats maybe uh, and and then his counting stats will be hurt again. Like if he slumps at all and he's platooning, 
Yeah, it could get bad, but I do like them in general in a in a shallower league more so. I, I guess maybe I'm a little bit more, uh, you know, in on on Josh Lowe. I I do think, you know, the Rays are always going to have some version of 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 platooning. It's just who they are. But I really don't know who like gets pulled out. To, or who gets put in to pull Josh Lowe out of the lineup consistently? Yeah, but that's like, like I feel like that's the way of madness because you start thinking, you start like way. thinking of that. You start, you start like thinking about like, well, who would possibly fill in for Josh Lowe? And before you know it, you're like, well, no one. And then you look at like then the first game of the season, and it's like he's on the bench for Johnny De, 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 De Luca or something, or he's like he's on the bench for like Harold Ramirez, and you're like, why would he be benched for Harold Ramirez? But that's just what Kev, Kevin Cash does, you know. Uh, no, I I completely get it. Uh, I guess my my thinking here is even if like they put in De Luca and Ramirez for low and I don't know, like whoever, Jose Siri. So you get both the righties in there for that one. Like why wouldn't load DH most of the time in that scenario? Like 240, he had 240 versus lefties last year. That's not, that's not the end of the world, but I, I, I understand. I understand where you're coming from. Um, Lowe did have 101 uh, plate appearances in September when the Rays needed wins. So I, I think, there's something to say that, you know, in the second half, low actually got better as a whole. Like the K rate improved, walk rate improved, WRC went up 20 points, average went up 35 points. Like he improved across the board in the second half. If he continues doing that, I think he maybe pushes their hand. Um, but we're speculating. Let's let's just move on from our speculating. Um, number 20 is Spencer Steer. We already talked about him. Next tier is number 21, Nick Castellanos. Last year, he had 29 home runs, 11 stolen bases, 79, 106, and hit 272. You have projected for 27 home runs, 8 stolen bases, 77, 89, and a 271 average. Um, I mean, the contact numbers bounce back pretty much in line with his career. So at this point, 22 just seems like a weird year. Yeah, no, exactly. I think that's what I think that's what happened there. I think uh, Castellanos had an injury in 2022 that affected everything because if you look at his numbers all his other all his other seasons were in line with 2023 uh minus the steals he, he usually doesn't steal that much but we know the pitch clock adds like you know five steals it's like the camera adds 10 pounds the pitch clock adds 10 steals, <laughs> but <laughs> Castellanos is basically just like, you know, he is what he is at this point. And just, I would just remove 2022 and see all his, and look at all his other years. And he's, you know, he's a 27 ish Homer guy with a solid average. Like he's a career 276 hitter and, you know, he's going to have uh, either five steals or 15 steals, and then probably somewhere in the middle, <laughs> depending on how much he wants to run. But yeah, I think he's pretty uh, he's pretty um, dependable. I like I actually I like Castellanos more so this year than I think uh, most people. I I'm I'm in on him as well. He's right now he's going at 102 overall. That feels like a steal, man. <laughs> That's I feel I know like it's like people are looking at outfielders different than they're looking at, um, you know, I don't know, uh, any other position really. But like Arenado is going way before Castellanos and like Arenado is not giving you 27 homers and eight steals as I have for Castellanos. Um, another guy is like, Goldschmidt, who I, who I like, I don't, you know, I don't necessarily hate Goldschmidt, but he's going 30 picks before Castellanos. His numbers are going to, his numbers are going to look similar to Castellanos. Um, let's see another guy. Um, well, anyway, I'm not going to go through, <laughs> I won't go through everyone. You should but, name yeah. everybody that has similar numbers, Greg. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think people get my point. Like, Castellanos is, he's a steal at like 100 and 
five or whatever overall. It's a it's a solid price for him. I I'm in on him. I I don't mind him at that cost at all. Um, you know, it just kind of depends on where you're at in your build a little bit in that round. Because a lot of times I think you and I are maybe grabbing pitchers in that uh, in that area. But yeah, I mean, I have no problem with his draft cost. I, I think it's a good value. As you mentioned, if you pretty much just ignore 2022, like the the numbers he's given you should earn where he's being drafted and probably better. Um, you know, you just kind of got to fall into what you're looking for in those areas, though, because, you know, there's still guys in the top, you know, 100, 110. There's a lot of guys that you can draft that you're going to like. So you kind of fall into certain guys, especially in stake drafts and then with team builds and things like that. Number 22 is Teoscar Hernandez. Last year, he had 26 home run, seven stolen bases, 70, 93, and 258. You have him projected for 32 home runs, seven stolen bases, 83, 91, and 263. Um, you know, I feel like with Teoscar, like the sum of the parts never equals the numbers that they should. Like he hits the ball incredibly hard. He runs fast, but yet he doesn't really hit 35 home runs. He doesn't really steal 20 bases and like, I, I don't really understand that, but he's still good. Yeah, that's a, that's a good way of uh, explaining him. That's true. He, he doesn't seem like, like, it's like every, everything looks excellent. If you look at like the, uh, under the hood, but then you, you see his actual numbers and you're like, it's okay. <laughs> I mean, he's he seems fine though. I mean, like if you take away his name and you take away Castellanos's name, I mean, it's why I have them next to each other in the uh, in my rankings. They're essentially the same thing. I I mean, uh, Teoscar. I don't know. Um, let me see where Te. Oh, Teoscar is actually. Well, I don't know. See, it's hard for me to say what the. Uh, I should actually update the ADP because what twenty seven. Uh, yeah. Okay. So he's at one twenty seven. So that's a good. I mean, that's good. <laughs> that's a that's a decent price. I I I, I would take him at uh, one twenty seven for sure. I would take him at probably like ninety ish. I you know if he gets uh, twenty seven homers, seven steals, and a two sixty plus average, that's you know like I just said that's Castellanos. That's Goldschmidt, that's all these other guys. It, it's uh, you know, it's 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 a lot of guys who are in that range of like seventy-five to one hundred and five overall. And Teoscar right now is going at one twenty-seven or one twenty-six or whatever you just said. So that's, I mean, that's a good price for him. I would, you know, I would grab him. I think he's um, he's probably moved up. He's probably moved up about a round since he went to the Dodgers. So some of that is like the ADP as, you know, it gets baked in early on and it's hard and it doesn't move that much. So, you know, like if he was always on the Dodgers, I think people probably would have had him higher originally. So right now you're getting a, a little bit of a discount on him just because he was unsigned for a, a, a few months or whatever. But I mean, Dodger stadiums much better than Seattle. So yeah, I would I would grab Tay Oscar where he's going for sure if I had that, you know, need in my lineup. Yeah, I I don't have any problem with him. Like I said, he he's always productive. I just feel like I feel like there's more. I just I always want more from him. Um and it just never never comes. But yeah, you're right. Like the draft price and the numbers he's given you are perfectly fine for where he's going in like the 130 range. Like just just outside of there, uh, or just inside of there, I mean. Um, so, yeah, no issue with that at all. Number 23 is Lane Thomas. Last year he had 28 home runs, 20 stolen bases, 101, 86, 268. Young projected for 23 home runs, 20 stolen bases, 78, 68, and 254. Uh, this is a guy that, you know, we I think we talked about almost every show for the second half to to identify where where we thought he lands and where people <laughs> landed around him because it's like, well, do you believe in him more than Lane Thomas? Maybe no. Like he he was kind of the marker of belief, um, and I feel like he's still in that area where like you believe on the guys maybe more above him and then below him or like 
you know, the guys we're still kind of either wishing upon or or something kind of needs to change still. Yeah, I, I think, you know, Lane Thomas was a guy who I really I wrote a sleeper post for him two years ago. I really liked him a lot. And then at some point, like when he started being good, I stopped liking him as much. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> I don't know why. I feel like there was a there was a point where like on the X and Y axis, there was a point where we overlapped perfectly with my excitement for him and how good he was, was perfectly aligned at like May of last year. <laughs> and then at a certain point, he just kept getting better. And I was like, nah, he's not that good though, is he? <laughs> and I, I sort of <laughs> flatlined. Um, I, you know, I like Lane Thomas to a certain extent. And if you look at, like, if you take away his name and you just look at his projections, in my projections even for him, you see a guy who's, like, essentially Yelich. I mean, his numbers really aren't that dramatically different. He's got a, uh, he's got a terrible uh, lineup. You know, I don't know how good the, bro- the Brewers are necessarily going to be. But the Nats, we know, are not going to be good. Um, but he does have C.J. Abrams in front of him, who should be on second base a lot because he's going to get on base and then run. So there's some, I mean, there's some potential here where Lane Thomas's RBIs can be somewhat decent. I think behind him is going to be awful. I mean, Ruiz is okay. But then you have, like, Joey Gallo. Like, ah, <laughs> what? I, <laughs> I, I hope Davey Martinez doesn't really <laughs> bat Gallo as the cleanup hitter. Uh, then they have Menendez, Winker, who will see, like, you know, 65 games. Then they have Senzel, who will see about 45 games. <laughs> and then they have Luis Garcia Jr., who's just, you know, he's one of the many Luis Garcias. And then they have Robles. So yeah, I mean, you know, I don't, I don't know how much Robles is really going to affect Lane Thomas. <laughs> He's hitting ninth, and Lane's hitting second. But you know, long story short, I like Lane Thomas. I think he's got twenty twenty potential. The counting stats probably aren't going to be great, and he's really not. He's not the best average hitter. Um, so his batting average, like he gets, he makes some pretty weak contact. Even last year. Like his average was 268, which is fine, but that was with a 325 Babbitt. And he's really, he's not really that high of a Babbitt guy because like his contact's a little iffy. So, anyway, I mean, he's fine in drafts where he's going. I probably am not going to be drafting him just because of, uh, I'll just probably be looking elsewhere. Because I, I just, you know, I'll probably be looking at guys like, you know, the unexciting Nick Castellanos, Yelich, Teoscar. Like, those guys are probably, on, they're on my board before Lane Thomas. So, I don't know. I, I don't really hate Lane Thomas, but there's a ton of outfielders in this range that I kind of like a little bit better. So, yeah, I'm, I'm out probably on Lane Thomas. It's okay, Gary. You can say you hate him. You, you, you hate Lane <laughs> Thomas. It's him. okay. I hate him. Uh, <laughs> so you mentioned the BABIP. It, it went from 380 in the first half, which is obviously high, down to 253 in the second half, which is obviously very low. So I think it kind of meets in the middle, and we get something of a middle ground in, in regards to BABIP. Um, and, you know, you think like, oh, maybe in the second half he sucked, he struck out a lot, uh, you know, the league caught up to him, whatever. Uh, actually, all the contact numbers pretty much in line across the board. First half, second half, um, contact rate, K rate, walk rate, ISO and hard hit were actually up slightly. So if anything, he got unlucky in the second half. So I- I'm kind of balancing all that out to say, you know, he had 268 last year with a lucky first half, unlucky second half. So I think 268 feels right around the for average area. Um, I know he doesn't hit the ball like, you know, crazy hard, but you don't really need to um, if you're, you know, squaring it up and, and putting it in the right areas. And he does have some speed, so he's going to steal some bases. I like Lang Thomas. I, I like him above his ADP for the, I mean, I understand that he kind of came out of nowhere. The, the like stat cast numbers aren't amazing. They're not eye popping, but I, I like him pretty significantly more than ADP. And he's probably one of the guys I'm going to end up with um, 
you know, fairly regularly, unless I just have way too many stolen bases off the top. Yeah, I mean, that's fair. He, I, I will say, uh, you know, his fly ball, I mean, he's all, he's kind of like, uh, his homer per fly ball seems a little bit high for him. But, I mean, you didn't think, like, if he got 20, 20, I have him projected for 23 homers. If he gets anywhere from, like, 20 to 24 homers and he still chips in 20 steals, it's not going to be that bad of a line. I mean, he's going to be a top 100 guy. It's uh, it's just a matter of whether, you know, the, where the runs and RBIs are going to be. But he should be, he should be a top 30 outfielder. Uh, unless like, you know, something dramatic happens with like an injury or something, but yeah, I, he should be okay. Yeah. I, at least for me, I, I know you kind of made the yellowish comparison. I, I think I see them very similarly in what they are, can provide. We saw Lane Thomas hit 28 home runs last year. I don't think yellowish has that in him anymore. Um, I think the steals yellowish still more last year, but I already mentioned this second half. Like, I think the steals are pretty similar. So I just I I like Lane Thomas. We can just move on from that. <laughs> uh, number number twenty four is Seiya Suzuki. Last year he had twenty home runs, six stolen bases, seventy five, seventy four, and hit two eighty five. You have him projected for twenty four home runs, eleven stolen bases, seventy seven, eighty two, and two seventy six. In his second season, he pretty much improved across the board, right? Uh, yeah, no, completely. I, you know, I think, uh, he kind of reminds me of, uh, similar to Teoscar Hernandez in like what you were saying with him, where the parts don't always equal the whole, like mm-hmm. say, say a Suzuki's like underlying numbers look great. I mean, his peripherals look fine. He looks like, he looks like a so- like a top 15 outfielder. But then when push comes to shove and, you know, his stats actually are on the page and you're like, well, 20 homers, six steals, 285. I mean, it's solid. It's, you know, it's not as good as I think his numbers are are telling people. Um, you know, like last year he was the, the 30th best outfielder on the player Raider. Uh, right now he's getting drafted as the 23rd best outfielder on the play Raider. I am at 24. So, I mean, it's like, you know, I'm near ADP on uh, Suzuki. I, I I don't hate him. I could see drafting him. I just don't see, like, you know, if anyone has him, like people are drafting him way before Teoscar Hernandez, for instance. And if you look at Teoscar Hernandez, is like he's got a higher ceiling for power roughly the same on speed and say a Suzuki should hit for a higher average, but average is fluky. And how much higher is it going to be? Like Teoscar isn't necessarily, you know, a, uh, a terrible average guy. Like he's, I haven't projected for 263 uh, and Suzuki I haven't projected for 276. So it's like, yeah, I mean, Suzuki should hit for a higher average, should have a, a couple more steals, but he has a, a much lower floor on power uh but you know that's you know in flux you know potentially i guess so yeah i i don't i don't i don't hate uh suzuki like it's like i don't mind any of these guys really will i be necessarily drafting him um maybe if he falls a little bit or the price is right on uh like in an auction draft potentially like i i could see drafting him He's not exactly a guy I'm targeting necessarily, but I, I could see getting him. Yeah, I and mean, I'm sure ADP will like tighten up, and and you know it'll he'll kind of go in this, a similar range. But when you're looking at these outfielders, like we've kind of talked about, like you can kind of go in any number of directions um, in regards to what you need, what you think an upside is, what you think playing time maybe looks like. So, like, this section of outfield is really tough to rank and, and even draft because it's it's like, okay, you know, Suzuki's going to give you 25-10, and, like, is that more or less useful than, you know, like a, a, what you're going to get from Josh Lowe or Castellot? Like, it, it, they're all round the same number so it kind of falls into this gray area i, I think the people maybe taking Seiya are doing a little mr pro raider on his second half where he hit 
313, had 13 home runs and five stolen bases. You know, you put that into a whole season that's like 20 home runs, 12 stolen bases, 300 average. Like that sounds that sounds really great. Um, and he he started both seasons a little banged up. Like he just isn't ready to start in spring for some reason. So if he can start the season healthy and kind of hit the ground running, I I could see it happening. Um, but but I'm kind of with you in that the sum doesn't equal what or the the parts don't equal the sum. And so you're kind of getting a lesser version of what ultimately I think he's capable of. Um, and I kind of feel like that about our next guy, at least this year. I, you know, I still love him. I think there's great things to come. At number 25 is Jordan Walker. Last year in 117 games, he had 16 home runs, seven stolen bases, 51, 51, and 276. He had him projected for 25 home runs, 10 stolen bases, 72, 81, and a 263 average. Uh, he had 274, two home runs, two stolen bases in his first 20 games. Got sent down, came back up in June and hit 277. Uh, so, I mean, he's he's a very good player. I have no questions about that. But I'm wondering if the tools still need a little bit of time just to give us, you know, the true power and speed numbers that we want from Jordan Walker. Mm, I love Jordan Walker. <laughs> I do too. And I really want to move him up higher in my ranks, but I just can't get his projections up to the point where it mm. makes sense to move him up into like, mm. you know, the top I, like 80, 90. I love him. I love him. <laughs> I love Jordan Walker. Oh my God. Like I see him hit a home run. I'm like, oh man, that's why I love baseball. <laughs> He's like the epitome of like everything. It's like perfect. Like, if I, I could see, like, I was, oh, man, Jordan Walker, man. If he just stays, if he stays on the field for, okay, so last year he had 16 homers in 117 games. His his launch angle wasn't bad. He did hit a lot of ground balls. His fly balls probably, you know, it'd be nice to see him hit a few more fly balls. But then he was sent down uh, supposedly because his launch angle and because he wasn't hitting as, as many fly balls they wanted, which is fine. I mean, that's fair. He hits the ball so hard and with such, I, I mean, he, he gets into, if he can get into like 25 homers, it feels like it's just a matter of, you know, just doing it. Like it, it doesn't feel, it doesn't feel impossible at all to, to imagine him hitting 40 homers. But if he can just get into 25, like, that's, like, nothing. Like, that feels like such a low bar for Jordan Walker to, like, hurdle. And then if you put in everything else, like, he had great contact last year. So his average shouldn't be bad. He hit 276 as a rookie, as a 21-year-old rookie with a 22.4% strikeout rate. Like, that is so good for a 21-year-old. So if he's just able to maintain his contact, he just has to get into 25 homers, which is a really low bar. He's got 10 steel speed, 25, 10, 265 feels like a really, like it feels like the floor. And that is as good as we were talking about with Seiya Suzuki or Teoscar Hernandez or Castellanos. Like that, like his floor Feels like Castellanos as a 20 now as a, a he's still 21. He's still 21 years old. Like as a 21 year old, his floor is a top 25 outfielder. I'm convinced of this. I love him. I love him. Give him to me. I'll take him. I'll, I'll, I'll take all the shares. Thank you. I love him. Yeah, I, I think my, uh, my concern with him is is a like I said I like twenty five ten like I don't know where he could get to thirty like the the power is legit he could he could hit more home runs the stolen bases really aren't going to come um you know we kind of talked about how Snicker for the Braves doesn't move his lineup around you know Marmol feels like I know he moved it around last year but that's that that was almost out of necessity because nobody was hitting for them. Like he feels like another one where he really doesn't want to move guys around and he's going to give the veterans their, their one, you know, their batting order. 
So like the best he can kind of get up to is like six. See, um, I see that. I see. I see a, a projected lineup with Lars Newbar platooning at the three hole, and I think no. <laughs> No, no, he's not. I don't like, think it's Lars. I think they just go real righty and right in the righty heavy right out of the bat. You know, they'll get. No, I they have a they have a I think they have a hole in the middle of their lineup that I think Jordan Walker can move up. I think he can hit like fifth for them potentially. I, I you know it's like uh, lineups are. I, I'll say with uh, like what you were saying they're going to get, you know, at some point they're going to get set in stone. And I agree, probably it, they're not going to get moved around too much, but I think Walker can move up in the lineup. I'm not worried about it. I love Jordan Walker. <laughs> <laughs> and like I said, I love him too. I just, there's a point where I can't move him up any higher in the rankings. And, and honestly, we probably have him around the same spot, <laughs> probably similar projections. Um, it's just, I guess maybe the way we're looking at the projections and maybe looking at upside here uh, to some extent and, and how we're viewing Jordan Walker. But, like, I like him. Like, I still like him. I, I have him actually above Nick Castellanos, who we had talked about, and you have, you know, higher than Jordan Walker. I just – I'm looking at the projections as very similar. Um, number 26 is Riley Green. 99 games last year. He had 11 home runs, seven stolen bases, 51, 37, and hit 288. Young projected for 24 home runs, 12 stolen bases, 84, 61, and 274. Uh, he had a stress fracture in his fibula in June and then had Tommy John on his non-throwing arm in September, but is said to be ready for opening day and has started taking swings at least. Um, if he wasn't coming off all that, Gray, I would, I would be a little bit more excited about Riley Green because he hits the ball real freaking hard. Yeah, that's fair, but I, I think he's fine. I, you know, he's so young. I, the the fibula is whatever. I, that's that was healed yeah. already, and the Tommy John surgery is a little bit concerning. But you know, he's not a pitcher. I'm not worried about it. I'm I like I think at worst it affects his power a little bit early on. But I mean, it's a six month season. As long as he's hitting for power by May, I, I think it's fine. It it was uh you know he's a a good deal away from the uh, the Tommy John at this point I, you know I like Riley Green a lot too I love him I am like uh, these guys I feel like Jordan Walker Riley Green and the next guy who we'll talk about in a second I think all of them can be like top fifty overall picks next year I, I'm I'm totally in on Riley Green like I see him and I again I'm like. I'm even going at the floor. I'm looking at the floor here for Riley Green, and I see a 20 homer, 10 steal, 270 hitter. And I'm like, that if that's the floor, man, give it to me. Give me the floor. I'll take it. I'll take the floor and and hope for the upside. Like he looks like a guy who could potentially be. Uh, I don't want to get too crazy with myself, but <laughs> 27, 15, 280. I mean, we're talking about a guy who's already looking at like a potential top 75 overall guy right now. He's going where Riley Green is. I mean, he's going so late. He's going at 160 overall. I mean, that's nothing. But that's a bargain, man. That's like, give me every share of Riley Green. Let me see what happens. I, I'm taking it. Uh, I'm in. Well, give it. Give it to me. Yeah, I mean, at, at that price, you know, I, I think some of that may be, you know, he had kind of the red, you know, injury logo next to his name. So maybe some of that's that. Um, yeah, I have no problem with Riley Green, especially he's going to drop in drafts. Uh, you know, I am a little bit more concerned, it sounds like, the TJ than you are, just because, like, we have, I mean, we have a case from last year where non-throwing hand, non-lead hand, like, Bryce Harper. It definitely saps some power from Bryce Harper. I'm just a little concerned. Even though Riley Green's younger, he can recover a little faster. We're going to lose a little bit of pop from Riley Green this year. I think long-term, you're fine. Um, you know, like you said, he's, he's 20, 23 years old. Uh, I'm just a little concerned for this year, but still. If he's going to drop into the 160s or beyond, I'm, I'm absolutely going to be on on Riley Green. Number 27, who you already teased a little bit, is Jackson Churio. 
122 games at double A. He had 22 home runs, 43 stolen bases, 84, 89, 280. Young project for 19 home runs, 28 stolen bases, 71, 76, and 249. He also signed a contract, which is rare for the, you know, the prospects, or I guess maybe more common nowadays, um, which gives him pretty much a free reign to make the make the lineup out of camp if he performs. Yeah, no, completely. Yeah, he's another guy who's just like, I'm so excited about drafting him. I I kind of want him in every league, too. Um, unfortunately, there's there's a, a, a handful of guys here. Like, the last five guys I've all wanted in every league. So, it might be, it might be a little yeah, bit of a start running issue. out of outfield spots and draft picks there eventually. <laughs> I, might, I might have to. I might need, like, six picks in the eighth round. <laughs> <laughs> Potentially, um, yeah. I mean, uh, he's like, pro- I- I'm surprised he's actually going as low as he is in drafts right now. His ADP is at 130. Uh, Jackson Cheerio, that is. Um, he seems locked into the uh, starting job because of the contract he signed. Like, I had I had some concerns back, like in November of last year. When, uh, you know, I was writing up my rookie outlook posts and uh, he hadn't yet signed. So I was worried that, like, you know, he was he wasn't going to start the year with the Brewers. But now that he signed the contract, everyone assumes he's going to start uh, on opening day. And, yeah, I I feel the same way. I think he is a lock for opening day. Uh, There's no reason to send him down. And he's only, I don't know, 19 years old. (laughs) He's 19, and he looks like the next Ronald Acuna Jr. Ah! Ah! (laughs) I mean, uh, you know what I'm saying? Like, we might be looking at a guy who could potentially, like, keep in mind that even Acuna wasn't, like, uh, a top 10 guy overall his rookie year. I mean, there's going to be some growing pains. There'll be a little bit of, you know, rookie hiccups, but... Even if he's a a top 30 outfielder at his floor, which I I think he is because he has so much speed. Like, you're looking at a guy who could potentially, like, a 15-homer, 30-steal season doesn't feel like like a stretch at all. So if that's the floor, I mean, you got to think there's going to be upside on the power. So looking at maybe 20 homers, there's going to be upside on the speed. Could we potentially get a, a 2040 rookie year? I mean, that sounds nuts, but also like players right now are like doing things that we've never seen before. So, I mean, I don't know. I mean, conservatively look at a, a fifth, you know, even the conservative uh, projections have him at a 15 homer, uh, 20, 20 steel guy. Uh, and 20 steals feels really. I mean, that feels really conservative for a 19-year-old coming into the league with the kind of speed he has. Like, he is – I mean, he's a 45-steal guy. And, you know, with the pitch clock and everything, um, yeah. I mean, I think the sky's the limit here. I'm absolutely drafting him if I can if I can get him for sure. Yep, love him. Um, you know, it, it does become hard because there are a lot of values that we've talked about in outfield or guys that we like. Um, you obviously can't draft them all. So you gotta gotta kind of pick and choose. And this is where you know build comes in, risk comes in, how much are you how much are you willing to take? You know, the eight team to eight or ten team versus fifteen team or only league, like all this starts to matter when we're when we're talking about where they fit in. But yeah, absolutely love all these guys we've talked about for the most part. Um Anthony Santander comes in at twenty-eight. Oh, he went for I uh, something stupid in the auction I just did uh, over at CBS, and uh, I feel really dumb about that one. Um, but it is what it is. All right, so 29 is Evan Carter. Last year in 23 games at the major league level, he had five home runs, three stolen bases, hit 306. And at double A in 97 games, he had 12 home runs, 22 stolen bases, 68, 62. Only eight games in triple A, but did hit 353 there. You have projected for 16 home runs, 24 stolen bases, 81, 72, and 264. Uh, Evan Carter, one one of the two very young, very promising 
outfielders for the Rangers, Gray. Where are you at on, on Mr. Carter? Uh, yeah, so I'm actually, I think I need eight picks in the in the eighth round. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really like I, I need a lot of picks in this in this in this little area of uh, the draft. Um, I yeah I love Evan Carter too. I, I think Evan Carter's probably not going to be appearing on a a ton of my teams just because like I like Jordan Walker, Riley Green, and Jackson Cheerio just a a tad bit more. But I like Evan Carter too. Like I think you know his power. Evan Carter's power might be a little bit lower than the other guys. Um, but I mean, maybe actually he's probably on par with like Jackson Cheerio, but uh, Evan Carter is still only, I mean, he doesn't turn, he turns, he's just 21. Like he doesn't turn 22 until August. Like he's still so young. The upside is immense. He's a, probably a 15 Homer guy right now with, you know, 25 steel speed, maybe even more on the speed. Like if he, if he gets into a run, like, I don't know, he could probably steal 40 bags, all things being equal. I don't know if they're going to actually going to run him that much. Like that might be the only issue that he may not run because the Rangers just may not run him, but he probably could steal 40 bags. Like I I think Evan Carter is also incredibly talented. Um, But yeah, I, I just don't, I don't know. I'm I'm just a tad bit lower on Evan Carter than I am on the other guys. So, yeah, I don't know if I'm necessarily going to be having him on teams, but I like him. I, I would draft him if uh, push came to shove. I like Evan Carter as well. I I think you know what you said is is fairly accurate. I don't know that the tools are necessarily as loud as like a Churio. I don't know if he hits the ball quite as hard as a Riley Green or a Jordan Walker, but. Um, you know, he's still very good, very solid across the board. And like you said, the issue may be that the Rangers just don't ask him to steal. I mean, last year as a team, the Rangers had six less steals than Ronald Acuna Jr. So <laughs> it's not like they're stealing, trying to steal a bunch, which made them fourth lowest, if you were wondering. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, and then you look at the, and then you look at the outcome of the World Series and you're like, why would you why would you bother <laughs> i mean you know it's like it doesn't get much better than winning the world series so it's like and if what got you to that point was not stealing why would you suddenly start stealing so i, I mean that is a concern with evan carter because his value is going to come a lot with steals uh, it definitely could could be there um but like you said he can't steal it's just it's just a matter of how much they're going to allow him, and that's why he's ranked below some of these other guys. Just, you know, the potential for for upside may be limited internally, not, you know, by the team, not necessarily by him. New tier starting at number 30 is Kyle Schwarber. Last year he had 47 home runs, 108, 104 on the counting numbers, and hit a grand total of 197 on the average front. Gray, um, <laughs> you haven't projected for 41 home runs. 97, 96, and a 191 average. Babbitt keeps dropping. Average keeps dropping with it. Um, but he is certainly one of the few, like, true power sources that you can get, you know, later in the draft. Yeah, I'm so out. Uh, finally, guys, I'm not drafting. <laughs> <laughs> we have finally gotten to the point where I am out on a player. Uh, yeah, I don't like Kyle Schwerber at all. I, I mean, as a as a person, he seems like a totally fine guy. <laughs> I, I actually, I like him. I like the Phillies, too. I, I like the Phillies a lot, actually, even though I'm not a Phillies fan. I do like the Phillies, but... I, Schwarber just looks like a disaster waiting to happen. I mean, it, it was a good year, and he hit 197. Are, are people out of their minds drafting? Like, this is like, they're drafting uh, Kyle Schwarber. He's basically Adam Dunn, and they're drafting him in the top 80 overall as the 20th outfielder off the board uh right after yelich in adp like that's nuts dude that's so crazy people are out of their minds like kyle schwarber uh if he gets like if he slumps and only hits 35 homers you're gonna have a guy with 35 homers 
and a 195 average. Ah, 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 ah. Not into that, man. Sorry. So, yeah, I'm out on him. Yeah, uh, I mean, I have him higher than you have him almost by default because you have him buried uh, so low. Um, he's, he, I mean, he's a team built guy. Like if you, if you need the power and you've just, you've neglected it through your first, you know, six, seven rounds, then, you know, he's your piece, but, you know, objectively just, just taking him in a vacuum, accepting the average hit is, is pretty tough. Um, cause it's not like you're going to find a ton of average as the draft goes on, unless you're just taking, you know, some of the empty average guys, and that's not really going to help your, help your squad either. So, um, you know, really a team build guy. He, he, he really, really struggled with the slider last year. Um, and that's, that's being gentle to say he struggled. He saw 511 sliders, gray. He hit O 66 with a 46.7% whiff rate and a 43%, 43.6% K rate. Uh, One of our, uh, Javi, Javi Baez just flinched <laughs> hearing that. <laughs> Why would you ever, ever throw him anything other than sliders? Like, even if it's a crap slider, just, just throw it. He has no idea what he's doing with it. Like, I, yeah. If they just, it, always, yeah. it always concerns me when fantasy baseball people have figured out a plan of attack for a player. Cause if we can figure it out, <laughs> I'm not, I, if we're figuring it out, the other teams are obviously figured it out. I mean, it's like, he's going to see so many, he's going to see more sliders than Javi Baez. He's going to see more sliders than Wimpy from the Popeye cartoons. What's up? Making dad jokes. Yeah, it's going to be bad. I'm, I'm out on Schwarber. Let's move on. Yeah, more, more sliders than a college frat house at 3 a.m. for sure. Um, <laughs> Moving on to 31, which seems like the complete opposite of Kyle Schwarber, is Brian Reynolds. Um, He's not a boom type of guy. He's going to give you very steady numbers, and that's all he's going to give you. Last year, he had 24 home runs, 12 stolen bases, 85, 84, and hit 263. You have projected for 25 home runs, 7 stolen bases, 81, 84, and a 260. Average, um, I mean, it's Brian Reynolds. I, I don't have anything really to add here. Ah, yeah, man. Brian Brian Reynolds is like a rich man's Brian De La Cruz, who is AKA Brian De La Snooze. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> this is not it's not a fun player to talk about. Uh, Brian Reynolds, the 24-ish homer, five to seven steel guy with a 260 average on a bad team ish bad ish i mean the pirates at least i give the pirates at least they signed them they gave him some money and they gave mitch keller some money so i guess there's that but yeah it's brian reynolds is boring man i i'm i'm not out i'm not in on brian reynolds either another guy where i'm like I see the ADP and I'm like, yeah, it's not, it's not going to be me. I, I mean, if, if you're taking Brian Reynolds, as ADP says, 15 spots before Nick Castellanos, you people are crazy, man. <laughs> you're crazy. <laughs> you're crazy if you're taking Brian Reynolds before Castellanos. I mean, let alone a full round before Castellanos. Oh, get out of here, man. That's, that's ridiculous. Forget that. Yeah. Come on. Yeah, I mean, I feel like if you draft Brian Reynolds at ADP, you're basically just accepting that you want somebody who's going to return ADP value. You don't want anything you're more. Like, you're you basically like saying you're you're saying like, hey, uh-huh. Uh-huh. I want to come in. I want to come in fifth overall in my league. <laughs> That's what you're saying if you take Brian Reynolds. You're like, you know what? I like to be the fifth best team in my league. <laughs> That's what I'm doing. I'm taking Brian Reynolds. Uh-huh. Yeah, I mean, it's just. If he follows the right point, there's value, but he's he's going to give you what he's going to give you. 32 is George Springer, uh, 154 games last year, the most he's played since 2016. He had 21 home runs, 20 stolen bases, 87, 72, and 258. Young projected for 23 home runs, 18 stolen bases, 84, 68, and a 252 average and 507 at-bats. 
I mean, he kind of reverted back to young George Springer, and then he ran more with the running rules changed. But, like, it's all about what, how many games he stays on the field, Gray, right? Yeah. No, he's, like, like this whole this whole tier is, like, this is like painful. I, I'm also George Springer. I've been I've been out on George Springer so long. Like uh, I've been I think I was in on Whit Merrifield, who I, who I don't like. I mean George Springer is like the outfield Whit Merrifield. Like I just I don't like George Springer at all. I, I like you know from a fantasy standpoint, obviously. I, I'm not talking about him personally. <laughs> I don't know him personally, but I don't like George Springer. Like what he brings, it's just it feels like all about the fall off of the table. Like, it all feels very, like, could be at any point just dreadful. <laughs> just awful. Like, his his Babbitt, his, his Babbitt's, like, maintained more or less where it's been for the last couple of years. But he's older player. I wouldn't trust the steals. I wouldn't trust the power. I don't trust him to stay on the field. I, I, yeah, I'm not in on George Springer. I will say it's kind of it, this is hilarious though. I, I wrote this up in the uh, in the rankings, um, the number the number one rankings uh, according to Fantasy Bros. Um, for well, that was last year, but I'm sure they'll be again this year. Uh, <laughs> I wrote up in the uh, in the rankings for the George Springer uh, blurb. I talked about how in uh, in 2015 he had the 52nd highest sprint speed and stole 16 bags which was his career high at that point. And then with the rule changes <laughs> last year, he was the 226 worst sprint speed and he stole 20 bags. Ah! <laughs> Steals are so ridiculous right now. I know sprint speed doesn't necessarily equate to steals, but I mean, it's just, this is, uh, I mean, the game right now is just so ridiculous that like if a player wants to steal 20 bags, they can steal 20 bags. Like, it has nothing to do... Like, okay, not not Vogelback. <laughs> not every player, but most <laughs> players. Um, anyway. Oh, no, Freddie Freeman might be on pace. Who knows? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Freeman, I mean, it's like... Uh, the older a player gets, if the rule changes enough, then they'll still, twil- they'll still steal 20 bags. It's, it doesn't matter. Uh, but anyway, yeah, I'm not really... I'm not a George Springer fan. I mean, a decade ago in the minors, Springer stole 45 bases, but that seems, uh, seems a <laughs> long time ago, you know? Um, yeah, yeah so, when, he was, when he was 23 versus uh, 33. <laughs> yeah, so I would agree. I don't, I don't, think, the, I don't think the stolen bases are, are repeating. Um, I know he stole 20 last year with the rule change, but lost, uh, you know, a half a foot per second, which we've talked about is not really what you want to see and, and generally trends to point or points towards a downward trend at 33, 34 years old. So you're banking on health. You're banking on speed maintaining. You're banking on, you know, the the batted ball maintaining. So there's there's a lot here to be kind of betting on if you're going to take him early. Um, he's going 125, which isn't too bad, but we've already talked about like eight guys ahead of him that you have ranked that are going – in the same area or after him. Um, number 33 is Jorge Soler. Last year in 137 games, he had 36 home runs, 77, 75, and hit 250. Young projected for 32 home runs, a stolen base, 73, 83, and 245. Um, I mean, it's basically like a Schwarber minus a few home runs like that's that's basically what we're looking at here with Solaire. Oh, and, oh, and, oh and like 50 points on average <laughs> i mean there's a there's definitely yeah. more average not that yeah, i'm not defending, I'm not defending Solaire. i don't really love Solaire either uh because i i think actually like Solaire's average should be in the 240 range which isn't great but you know better than schwarber but anyway i i i worry that like solar definitely feels like a guy who he sort of turns it on in his contract years. I'm not. I'm not <laughs> saying. I'm not saying he doesn't care the other years. But if you look at his numbers and you're like, "Wow, the contract years," he was really good. In those. Like you know, I mean, 2020 was a, a weird year, obviously. But I mean, like last year was a contract year, and he was like, "Oh, oh yeah, I'm playing. <laughs> let's let's do this." 
Um, he hits everything in the air. So, and, and Sam Fran is obviously not the best of uh, parks. Uh, not that, like, I don't think he really, it doesn't really matter with him because, like, you know, Miami wasn't a great park either. I and think Solaire can hit it. Yeah, Solaire can hit it out of any park. So I'm not so worried about the San Fran thing. But, yeah, I mean, he, he feels like a floor uh, 20, uh, excuse me, 32 homers and 245. Like, that, like his projection is 32 homers, 245. That feels about right. But I, I think his floor could be a little like he could have one of those like 27 homer 240 years that is just like, you know, barely above like a Randall Grechek type year. And it's like, uh, yeah, not good. So, yeah, I, I don't I, I'm not really in on Solar either. I mean, he, he's fine if he's going late enough, which he seems to be. Uh, I think his eight, his ADP is much later than, you know, the the guys we have been talking about. Uh, Solaire is going at 156. That, that again, that might have a little bit of baked in for the fact that he was a free agent for so long. It might be baked into that a little bit, but yeah, he he seems that seems about right for his price. Like you know, 140. I, I could see going. You know, potent 150. I could see potentially drafting him. I'm I wouldn't be totally excited about it though. Yeah. Uh- you know, I, that's fair. Everything he said's fair. I, it sounds like I'm a little bit higher on him just because, again, getting serious power in the draft is not the easiest thing to do after, say, 150. And he's going after 150. I mean, he's going you know, 80, 90 picks after Schwarber. And player rater wise probably pretty similar in regards to what they're going to end up at. Um, I know Schwarber obviously... Last year had a better um, play rater with the you know 47 home runs, but we've already talked about how that could definitely be heading in, the, in a different direction. Um, and with the average, you know, I, I like Solaire, um, especially since I tend to build speed early. So definitely a guy that fits certain builds. And I, I think one of the guys who may get drafted earlier than ADP says if there's too many speed heavy builds in the room. Number 34 is Estuary Rees. He is the uh, guy that you are looking if you did not go speed heavy as a build, because last year he had five home runs, 67 stolen bases, 47, 47, hit 254. You have projected for six home runs, 51 stolen bases, 54, 57, and 241. Went through about a two-month case of the shanks where he couldn't do anything right. <laughs> yeah, but other than that, Gray, he was what we thought we, he was. <laughs> the case of the shanks. Uh, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't know there. I didn't know he had a case of the shanks. Um, yeah, I mean, he is what he is. Really, there's not a ton to talk about with him. I think he's like you know, he's a sixty-five steel guy with literally nothing else. <laughs> I mean, hopefully, and hopefully you get the 65 steals. Um, you know, as you mentioned, my projections, I'm around 50 steals. I mean, even even 50 steals, I guess he, I guess that's worth it if you need steals. But yeah, there's there's really nothing else here. I mean, he is he's he's like the last of the remaining Sagnoff guys. Like for you know, like the days of like Niger Morgan and Rajai Davis are kind of like those guys in the Juan Pierre's of the world. Like those guys are kind of like not as, not as prevalent right now in the league, but Ruiz is, uh, he's in that mold. He's in like the, the Juan Pierre mold. Play speed has been uh, emphasized less in our game. You know, maybe the, the rule changes are changing that. And, you know, it's always useful to have a guy like that, especially if you can at least get on base sometimes. Um, but yeah, it's it's a team built thing here. If you need just a ton of stolen bases this late, Estuary is your guy. And like you said, there's not a lot of them like him left in the game. So, you know, if if that's what you need, you may have to reach a little bit for him. Um, but just know what you're getting. Number 35, and for the life of me, I'm gonna own him in every single league. Gray. Um, I actually had to drop him in my overall because it was he was way too way too high based on ADP. And that is Cedric Mullins, who last year had 15 home runs, 
19 stolen bases, 51-74, and hit 233. Young projected for 17 home runs, 24 stolen bases, 57, 71, and a 229 average. Um, started the season fine, had a groin injury, came back, had another groin slash quad injury, um, and just like either he wasn't right when he came back or he is completely dead because he hit 209 in the second half. Um, I just think he was injured, so I'm I'm back in on the injury bounce back, Cedric Mullins. 35, it feels like you can kind of go either way. Uh, no, I'm totally out on him. Okay, you're <laughs> just not. I'm you're completely just not out happy. on Cedric okay. Mullins. No, I, I'm surprised. He's probably, I mean, for the most part, it sounds like we agree for the most part, but I, I feel like Cedric Mullins might be the one where it, it might be the most disagreement that we're in because I couldn't be more out on Cedric Mullins. I think his, his launch angle is ugly. I, he's not a power hitter, and he's got, like, a terrible – like, he's got a terrible approach. I honestly would, wouldn't be shocked to see him get platooned. Like, right now, he feels like the odd man out in that new upcoming uh, Orioles lineup. Like, he looks to me like a guy who's – like gonna be like a Jorge Mateo, but from the other side. Like he's a a lefty who looks like he's he's like the odd man out. Like Gunnar Henderson, Adelaide, Santander. Like all these guys are are getting better, and he's getting worse. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised to see him hitting ninth at, at some point and platooned. I'm really out on Cedric Mullins. I I couldn't be more out on him. Like his Babbitt. And his fly balls, like they show, they say to me, like this guy is like he's a he's hitting a lot of two hundred and seventy five foot outs, which is not good. Like if he were to, like he should switch his launch angle with Yelich because if Mullins were to hit uh, like for you know a five to a ten launch angle and have a lot more ground balls and line drives, like I rarely ever want a guy hitting ground balls. But with Mullins, I wouldn't mind if he hit a few more ground balls. Like, he hits way too many fly balls. I'm I'm honestly, I'm kind of surprised you're in on him because I'm so out on Cedric Mullins. Yeah, I mean, I, I understand everything you said, and it, my, my counterpoint would be that it's all based on last year where he was literally banged up from June to the end of the season. Everything before June is directly in line with everything he's done in his career. Um, so that's I, I'm basically just giving him the pass because of the injuries. I understand if you're not. Um, it, it certainly looked bad once he came back. But April and May, if we're just saying like he got old and it, he sucked, like April and May were fine. He looked exactly like the Cedric Mullins you drafted. And then he got hurt. I'm I'm banking on the fact that, you know, he was hurt. You can get him at a ridiculously low cost. And, you know, I don't think he's, you know, 30 home runs. I don't think that's happening ever. I think that was an outlier anyways. But, you know, if he steals 25, 30 bags, hits you, you know, your 15 to 20 home runs, that's. 2030 is pretty solid to get, um, you know, past 150. And yeah, so moving on, next tier, 36 TJ Friedel. Uh, last year he had eight home runs, 27 stolen bases, 73, 66, and 279. Young projected for 16 home runs, 28 stolen bases, 84, 65, and 270. I mean, you just look at, like, the numbers he produced and the projection, and it feels like he's low a little bit. Um, but maybe it's the playing time. And also, is the name just really unappealing? <laughs> yeah, I don't know, man. He's, like, so underrated. Like, I I feel like I would have – I could have written a sleeper post for every Reds player except for Ellie De La Cruz. <laughs> like, I <laughs> – I, I worry that I'm like losing my mind uh, a little bit with the Reds because I feel like I might be too crazy about all of them, and people uh, are for some reason I'm I'm seeing something that other people aren't, or 
other people are seeing stuff that I'm not. So it's like it's got me really puzzled because like you look at his numbers and it's like, why why, why is he so low? <laughs> why why is he getting drafted so like last year on the player raider, he was the twenty third best outfielder. Um and now he's going at like what like thirty six overall uh, out of the outfielders I'm I I'm even too low on him and I like him I yeah I mean I don't know like I guess because maybe it's a, a little bit out of boredom that people just don't really like they they think other names are more exciting I mean uh, speaking for myself I I obviously must think other names are exciting because I have them below like the Riley greens and the Jordan walkers of the world, but I don't see much difference between uh, Friedel and those guys. Like, and if you look at the projections, even if you take me out of the equation, like people are saying like, he's going to hit 15 to 17 homers in uh, most projections. And he just stole 27 bags. Now the projections are saying he's only going to steal 20 but that's ridiculous. We we know no one steals the last this year. <laughs> like, I don't know what's going on with the projections, but we know people don't steal less anymore. They steal more, if anything. So assuming he steals the same 17 homers, 27 steals, a 275-ish average, uh, I mean, that's basically a top 25 outfielder. I mean, that's really good. <laughs> I completely agree. Um, I, I like I said, I, and I think there's even some room for growth there. He's still young. I mean, he's he's uh, I guess not young. He's 28. Um, but like in that park, he only played 138 games last year. That might be what he plays this year, just because of the pieces, the moving pieces there in Cincinnati. So maybe there's just some counting number drops for for why we're higher on Reds. But like. If the Reds offense is what we think it is, a few less plate appearances is going to be made up by the power of this offense. Um, you know, and Friedel seems pretty safe in his playing time. He can play all three outfield positions, maybe the only guy in their outfield that can play all three positions. So I, I, I like him a lot. Number 37, which starts a new tier, is Jaron Duran. 102 games last year. He had eight home runs, 24 stolen bases, 46, 40, and 295. Young rejected for 15 home runs, 31 stolen bases, 86, 55, and 266. He had a torn flexor tendon in his left big toe in August that cost him the rest of the season. Um, you know, batted ball looked a lot better in 23 than in his previous call-up. Jaron Duran is, uh, you know, another potential speed guy, you know, not necessarily in the upside of an Estuary Ruiz, but, Ruiz, but you know, he, he's kind of the the lesser Ruiz speed version, and uh, he's not going to take your average. Yeah, and he probably, I, I mean, I, I think he's, pr- like, he's getting projected for around 15 homers from people other than me. So it's like, I... I have him for 15 homers. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't think he's going to kill you in power, really. I mean, that's, obviously, that's not a 30 homer hitter, but still, 15 homers. Uh, ver- so look at him versus like Evan Carter. I mean, 15 homers, 25 steals for Duran. I, it's like there's so many of these guys. There's a lot of 15 homer, 25 steal guys right now, and that's not a bad line. So then if you look at, like, his average, Duran's, that is, uh, he hit 295. That was with a high Babbitt. But still, he had a 24, uh, well, just under 25% strikeout rate, which isn't terrible for a rookie. Yeah, I mean, I think he could hit 265. Like, most people are projecting him for 255, 255 to 260. I have him at 266. It's like, it's kind of a rounding error, really. But, you know, my biggest concern, I think, is whether or not he faces lefties. I I would, he was a, I mean, he was decent versus lefties. Last year, he had 289 versus lefties. So I don't really see why he would platoon. I guess there's that possibility. But then who are they playing out there? <laughs> They're not playing Bobby Dahlback. I mean, he's 
Duran is the center fielder. So it's like, who's he platoon? Like, why would he platoon, first of all? Because he hit 289 versus lefties. And who's platooning with him? Like, who's playing center? I, I don't know. Maybe Tyler O'Neill. Yeah, and I was going to say, O'Neill probably slides over if they need somebody to play center. Right, but what, like, why do that? <laughs> I don't, yeah, I I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I think Duran is probably under underrated right now in drafts. Um, yeah, I, I like him too. I, I like so many of these guys. I almost feel like it's like don't draft an outfielder until around 150 and then just grab a bunch. <laughs> I, I Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm in. I'm in on Duran. I, you know, I, I worry a little bit, like I said, a, le- a little bit about the platoon possibility just because he's a lefty, but there shouldn't be a platoon there. And he's good with the glove, so we'll see. I, I mean, I'm, I'm in though on Duran in general. I like him. Great, you just draft Ronald Acuna right off the bat. You fill your <laughs> infield spots, draft, draft three pitchers, and then you grab your outfielders. Like that's a like game it. plan right there. Yeah, yeah I like it. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, Duran Duran was was really good. I mean, you don't really think of speed guys usually as having good bad ball numbers. But his were actually really solid across the board, like not standout, but like he was top 60 in hard hit and EV 50. He was top 100 in average exit velocity. He could pull one down the left field line in Boston. I mean, I'm pretty sure I could pull one down the left field line in Boston if, and I'm not even a lefty. So like, I feel like there is some upside for power potentially. And I don't think like he's the typical slap hitting speed guy that's not going to give you you know average or anything like i think there's a there's a really solid player there um number 38 is tommy Edmond. we talked about him already 39 is james outman last year he had 23 home runs 16 stolen bases 86 70 and hit 248 this year you're projected for 27 home runs 19 stolen bases 78 86 and a 256 average it's kind of a like which James Outman, are you buying? Did you are you buying the the hot start, James Outman? Are you buying the middle of the season, James Outman, that was absolutely horrendous, or the second half, James Outman, which was very middling? Yeah, I I, I mean his second half was uh, he had twelve homers and two sixty four in the second half, and eleven homers and two thirty six in the first half. I don't know. I, I wrote a sleeper post for James Outman. So I obviously am in on him. I, you know, I, I see a guy who's surprisingly uh, low in the uh, in drafts from what I can gather. I mean, he's got a, you know, he's coming out of his rookie year when he hit 23 homers, stole 16 bags and hit 248. Even if he were to repeat that, just repeat it. <laughs> and it's like he's going to return the value of where he's going in drafts, which is around 185 overall. I mean, just just repeat the year is all he needs to do. Why he would just repeat it and not get better? I mean, I don't know. That's on people. I mean, he did have a high strikeout rate, so there, I guess there's a little bit of concern there. Um, I you know he walks a ton. He has he's got a good eye. He just strikes out a lot. So I, I mean, I like him. He's got decent speed. He's in a great lineup. Feels like a no-brainer to me, honestly. I, I'm I'm in on James Alman. All right, this might be our second second <laughs> disagreement, really, of the day. I am <laughs> I, I'm pretty much out on, on James <laughs> Alman. Like, if he drops to a ridiculous point, I'll, I'll take him. But like, I I don't like it. The K rate was awful. Um, at least he takes walks. Um, but he took, you know, I just didn't love it. Um. 343 bad bit and he had 248. Uh, the batted ball is really not impressive. Like he is, Jaron Duran makes his batted ball look, you know, Jaron <laughs> Duran's batted ball is a lot better than James Outman's. Um, and James Outman has somehow at 23 home runs. Like, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't think I'm going to own much of James Outman this year. And, you know, I'm not sure that he's ever, he's an everyday player. Um, if he struggles, like, they have righties to put in there. They have other lefties that can play center field. Um, they, I mean, he has two options left. They could send him down. It's the Dodgers, so we know they're not above paying somebody and deferring money for eight years. Like, anything could happen with with the Dodgers lineup. And, 
Like if he struggles, if he goes another what he did in the middle of the season where he went like 165 for a month and 220 the next month with no power and no speed and didn't do anything. I I don't know that his spots as secure as maybe like the projections say it is. But that's just going to be our difference. We're just not <laughs> going to be agree on James Altman. Uh, we'll we'll keep a tally of these two guys that we disagree <laughs> on in Bobachet, and uh, we'll just see where it ends at the end of the Bo- season. Bobachet. <laughs> well, he's always on that. He's always going to be on that list, right? Always. Okay. Uh, next tier, number forty is Lord Escarrel Jr. Last year he had twenty four runs, five stolen bases, sixty five, eighty two, and hit two sixty one. You have projected for 22 home runs, six stolen bases, 72, 86, and 274. Um, this feels very Brian Reynolds, Cattell Marte, minus counting stats. Like we're starting to get into that period of the draft where they're useful, they're productive, but damn, is it boring? Yeah, no, definitely. I think uh, he's a he's a solid guy to end the podcast on it because he's super boring. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean. Honestly, I was just there's not much to say about with uh, Lords Goriel Jr. Other than like I was looking at looking at the roster resource and they have him batting eighth, which is like, huh? I mean, he batted. I think he had like 400 plus at bats between hitting third, fourth and fifth last year. And they went to the World Series again, like I was saying earlier with like the Rangers and not stealing. It's like they they already had success with Lords Goriel Jr. hitting in the middle of the lineup. So, I mean, I know they added Jock Peterson, but Jock Peterson's not. <laughs> come on. I mean, come on. I mean, it's like. Look, Ray, when you get Gabrielle Moreno in front of him, you got to do it. <laughs> I know. It's like, come on, guys. Like, there's no like way Thomas. Lords Goriel. Like, Lords Goriel Jr. will probably get 400 plus at bats between the third fourth and fifth hole of the lineup like that they have him hitting eighth is just like i mean that doesn't make any sense <laughs> but other than that i i think lord's great you know lord's great jr is fine if you need like a solid batting average guy with a little bit of power and very little speed who should get counting stats uh assuming i'm right about where he hits in the lineup uh he's fine i i don't like I don't have a ton, really, like against Lords Goriel Jr. If you're, uh, you know, you're building your team in a real boring way. No, <laughs> if you're if you're building a guy, if you're building a team and you need like a solid middle of the order type, like guy who's gonna like you know give you what you expect without like you know crazy upside slash downside. It's like in a lot of in a lot of leagues. Like a Lords Goriel Jr. might be more valuable than even like a a, a Duran or uh, you know a guy above um, like a Cedric Mullins. <laughs> I like Lord I Lords Goriel Jr. I feel like he's a lot safer than Cedric Mullins, but I'll just end it there. All right, well we'll end it there. Um, you know we we really really pressed in uh, promoting the second half outfield show when uh, we ended on Lourdes Gurriel and said <laughs> that he's about as boring as it could possibly get. Um, but like he's going 150 picks after Brian Reynolds. Like what's the, what's the difference, Gray? What's the no, difference between Brian That's Reynolds a, and no, Lourdes Gurriel? Honestly, th- exactly. I'd love, honestly, I'd love someone who drafts Brian Reynolds. I'd love to, we should bring them on the podcast and be like, so what's the difference, bro? <laughs> Why did you draft <laughs> Brian Reynolds inside the top That'll be the whole picks. podcast. We'll have we'll have a two-hour podcast of just being like, so what's the difference here, man? Yeah, Brian Reynolds, Lourdes Gurriel Jr. You tell me what the difference is. Brian yeah, Reynolds, uh... literally, I'll tell you. I, I can tell you it's three to four steals. <laughs> That's the difference. <laughs> that that a, a one day from some one one game from Estuari Ruiz <laughs> is the difference. Um, but yeah, you you tell me what the difference is. Estuari didn't even need to start that game either. I mean, <laughs> he didn't he even need in. to start it. That's the difference. A game where Ruiz comes in in the sixth inning is the difference. That's the difference. Yeah. So just <laughs> you know, put this in perspective as you're drafting Brian Reynolds. 
some of those other boring players in the in the earlier rounds. Like you can get boring production that's later. Like go for some go for some shots. Grab those power speed guys. Grab the guys with some upside, um, knowing that you can backfill. Like you end up with Lourdes Gurriel as your outfielder four, and you know for whatever reason. Cedric Mullins falls off the map and is never useful again for fantasy. You're still okay. You still have an outfielder for. Um, we're gonna end it there. We have about 80 more outfielders, I think, to cover in the <laughs> second one. But we're just gonna say this is boring and move on for about half of them. So it's okay. We'll get to them. Um, as always, find us on Twitter. I'm at Razbedon. Gray is the owner of the at Razball account. Sign up for RCLs. Uh, if you have specific questions, find us in the comment section or on youtube.com slash Razball Fantasy. Until next time when we jump in in the second half of Outfielders, which is going to be super exciting, Gray, about as exciting as the Catchers podcast. <laughs> I will talk to you later. All right, ladies.